Good evening. Welcome to another program by Mashpee Clean Waters. My name is Rosa Whiting and I am a volunteer with Mashpee Clean Waters. And tonight's presentation is on the PFAS in Mashpee. Uh, to begin with, um, I'm going to just um, show you a few slides. So, and it's not working. Okay, so what are PFAS? PFAS are um, a group of man-made chemicals per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, and it incl includes um, a number of different acronyms, uh, PFOA, PFOS, um, and you're going to see a lot of those. PFAS have been manufactured, used in all kinds of industries. You can find them in a number of uh, very common household situations and in the environment. However, excessive uh, exposure can cause a number of health defects. Where are PFAS commonly found? They are found uh, in many workplace situations, drinking water, living organisms um, pick up the PFAS and they stay in our fatty tissue. They do not get um, washed out like vitamins and some other things. Uh, so uh, the buildup over time does cause a number of problems. Uh, they have been um, phased out of a lot of products uh, and other things are substituting, but like many things uh, in this country, we use the product and then find there's a problem with it. Whereas in some other countries, they test it first and you know decide not to use it. But so that's kind of one of the situations here with the PFAS chemicals, because they have been widely used. Some of the problems that um, people can face from this um, include, mm, many of your systems being affected. So I'm not gonna uh, dwell on this. I just want you to understand that there are a number of health concerns related to PFAS in the environment. So I want to introduce our first guest speaker it is going to be Rose Forbes. Uh, she comes to us from the Air Force Civil Engineer Center. Uh, she's a remediation program manager, and she will lead off with a short summary of the program. That will be followed by Mary O'Reilly, who is a hydrogeologist with Jacob Engineering Group, and she will present an update of their PFAS presentations. Andrew Gottlieb uh, will be providing a short response. He is a current Mashpee Selectman and the Executive Director of the Association to Preserve Cape Cod. We're going to have hopefully some time for questions and answers afterwards, but I would ask that you would write any questions that you have in the chat box. Oh, um, no. If we don't get to them today, we will write your questions and try to find a response for them um, on our Facebook page. So um, without further ado, um, welcome Rose. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks to everyone who, um, for having us this evening. And I'm going to share my screen. Please let me know if you don't see it. Entire screen. Share. Um, can you see it? I got a thumbs up. Yep. All right. So I just... Uh, got a new computer and these annoying pop-ups happen, so I apologize for those in advance. Uh, so tonight we'll be talking about our uh, installation restoration program here at Joint Base Cape Cod, and uh, our team members include Doug Carson, who's on on the, on the this uh, meeting, as well as Mary, who will be presenting a little bit later. Uh, I have a number of slides, but I plan on going through them quickly, as long as this advances like I'm asking it to. There we go. Uh, just there's our overview. I'll give a background. We'll talk just briefly about um, some of our sites, our source area sites, as well as our groundwater plumes, a little bit about rec beach monitoring, and then we'll jump into emerging contaminants after that. How's everything going? Can I, am I getting a check in here? Everything okay? Thumbs up? You're great. I'm sorry? You're great. Oh, okay, excellent. I just wanted to hear you say that a second time. 
Okay, so our IRP background, um, the restoration program here began in 1984. We were added to the national priorities list in 1989. Uh, AFCAC Air Force Civil Engineer Center became, um, came up to uh, Joint Base Cape Cod here, or Ma Massachusetts Military Reservation at the time, back in 1996. And we've been managing the program ever since. Um, our regulatory authority is CERCLA, uh, most commonly known as Superfund. And we have a federal facilities agreement that's signed by the EPA, National Guard Bureau, as well as the Air Force. So just a little background there. This uh, slide is a summary slide of all of our sites that we managed and continue to manage. Um, the green colors are source areas like landfills or storm drains. Um, the purple sites are the military munitions response program sites and uh, some the orange sites are source area sites that are closed as opposed to the green ones that and the purple ones that are open and the yellowish colors those are our remaining groundwater plumes a number of them have been cleaned up as i'll show you in a, a slide a little bit later on and then the pinkish colors those are the pfas groundwater plumes that we're managing and then you also see some call out boxes there that are in black and white. And those are our PFAS source areas that we haven't identified. Well, we've identified there's groundwater contamination, but we haven't delineated any plumes associated with those sites yet. And we'll be doing that um, this coming year as, as um, the remedial investigation proceeds. So there's a lot on this slide and you have it for reference and I'm happy to take questions if you, if you have any questions on that later on. Here's a site summary, uh, how many sites that we've dealt with. Uh, we have over 100 sites, uh, 70 of those have been closed. We have 10 military munitions response program sites and we've closed two of those. Um, and these are source areas I'm talking about right now. Nine open IRP sites, which are source areas, and there's an alphabet soup there. So Mary's probably going to mention some of these as well. So I'll just tell you that the CS is chemical spill, FS is fuel spill, uh, FTA, fire training area, uh, LF is landfill. And if you have any questions on any of these acronyms, feel free to uh, just interrupt me and I'll define them. We have 18 groundwater plumes, some of which are no longer defined and some of which are, have been completely cleaned up. And then we also have 12 emerging contaminant sites, uh, which are both PFAS and dioxane. And uh, we'll talk more about those in subsequent slides. But most people uh, know that the sole source drinking water aquifer in the Upper Cape is called the Sagamore Lens. Um, it extends from Cape Cod Bay to Nantucket Sound out to Bass River into the Cape Cod Canal. And it's a very prolific aquifer. Anywhere you drill, you'll find water. Um, but what some people might not know is that the, the mound of the Sagamore Lens is actually under the main part of or the sort of the north central part of the base on on the east side in Sandwich and it gives the plumes char the characteristic uh, flow path that is that any contamination that originates um, near that that mound or anywhere beyond there it will take on the uh, the radial flow pattern so that's why some of the plumes go out, like CS19 goes off to the northwest, some goes off to the east, some go to the southwest, south, southeast, and that kind of thing. And then as the plumes get further away from the mound too, they, they might experience the uh, hydraulic uh, impact or influence from some of the surface water bodies like say a Schumann and John's Pond. So just trying to explain a little bit about uh, the nature of what these groundwater plumes look like. And most everybody knows that the Cape is primarily sand as far as the lithology goes, but we do have some clay lenses and some silt lenses in, in the, uh, the aquifer, in the lithology of the aquifer. And in general, uh, depth to groundwater is about 40 to 80 feet below ground surface. But as you get closer to kettle hole, like the ponds, like a Schumann John's ponds, those are called kettle hole ponds, those are groundwater. And depth to bedrock is about 300 feet. And so that forms the unconfined sole source drinking water aquifer that we, we work with. Um, let's see, 
we can talk about um, in the past, we've had some uh, uh, some mitigation measures, um, response actions to help mitigate any exposure and, and control contain any additional exposure. We do that through plume containment or residential well hookups to municipal water, land use controls to make sure no one's putting in a, a drinking water well in areas where there might be contamination. And we've done that with what we call the legacy contaminants, um, the chlorinated solvents and the fuels. And now we're doing the same thing with emerging contaminants. And uh, Mary will talk about specifically PFAS here in her part of the presentation. Uh, this next slide just shows the legacy contaminants that I just talked about. We dealt primarily with chlorinated solvents like PC and TCE and ethylene dibromide. And um, the plumes, some of the plumes were uh, relatively large, uh, several miles long, uh, over 100 feet thick, um, a mile or two wide. And in order to address that contamination, we constructed nine total treatment plants, uh, one, is, one of which has been shut down. But it, in 2005, 2006, that's when we had the majority of the, the work going on, we were at 18 million gallons per day. So we were pumping and treating 18 million gallons per day. And now we're down to 8 million gallons per day because much of that contamination has been cleaned up, or at least the legacy contaminants. And just some um, other figures, we installed over 27 miles of pipeline. We have over 130 extraction reinjection wells, many of which have been shut down. We've got thousands of monitoring wells. So uh, this next slide here shows in the left panel um, the maximum size of any one of our plumes historically at any one time, not in any one year, but at any one time. And the reason we put this slide together is to compare it to where we are currently, and that's the right panel. So if you look at the yellow colors, you can see a lot of that yellow is gone, especially in like the southwest area off base. Uh, much of those, many of those, um, much of the contamination is cleaned up. We've actually shut down systems and uh, are closing some of the sites. And then you'll notice like FS1 plume and MASHP is gone. And uh, but then you see these these pink plumes. So this is the area where we have PFAS contamination. Um, one plume in Bourne, uh, a portion of the landfill plume in also in Bourne has some contamination. And then of course the, the plume that we're gonna focus on tonight, which is the large one that's coming from the fire training area uh, into Mashpee and Falmouth. Um, just real quick, I just wanna talk a little bit about the military munitions response program sites so you're aware of them. This is a summary and I'm not going to read through it. It's there for your reference. If you have questions, you can certainly ask or call me later on. Um, but this is the location of these MMRP sites. They're ordnance related sites. So uh, we're looking for things like maybe grenades or, or bombs that could be practice bombs. They might be live rockets, that type of thing in these sites. And the one site that's in, well, there's actually two sites, but the one that's closest in Mashpee is the Ordnance Area 1, which is down off Back Road. And we just finished investigating that site and didn't find any ordnance there. So I just wanted to report that. Uh, some of the other plumes in Mashpee include FS1, which is a ethylene dibromide plume. I mentioned that a little bit ago, but I have a slide that shows how that plume has cleaned up over time, starting in 2001, moving to 2012, 2018. By 2019, it was gone. And we just prepared the remedial action closure report for this site and submitted that to the regulators for review. Now, we do know we have PFAS in this area, um, but that's unrelated to the fuel spill one site. So we, we are committed to continuing to investigate and addressing the PFAS in this area. And Mary will talk about that as well. A couple other plumes in Mashpee, um, this one called Landfill 2, Fire Training Area 2, and uh, it's a fuel, fuel type plume. And here's the, where the it's located. It's kind of near back road. It reaches up onto the base. Um, and it's, uh, it, it, we're basically monitoring this plume and it's not advancing any further. So we're estimating by about 2035, this plume will be cleaned up. And a similar plume is called the petroleum fuel storage area, also in Mashpee, a same type of contaminants. And that plume is also near back road and extends over to the Orenda area. Um, and same kind of idea as the, the other plume I just talked about, the LF2 
landfill two fire training area two plume. Uh, this petroleum fuel storage area plume is anticipated to clean up by 2035 as well. And it's not migrating any further. It's in a steady state as we refer to it. And the last plume, I'm well, there's two more plumes. So uh, this chemical spill 10 plume, it's primarily a chlorinated solvent plume that originated at Utes Bowmark on the base. And here's the cleanup progression. It's a very large plume. And even though the northern, um, the Utes Bowmark area in the north part is considered to be the primary source area, there's a number of source areas on the base that contribute to this contamination. And we do have a pump and treat system that's cleaning it up. Um, but it it's it's a large plume, so it's not cleaning up as fast. And you can see it has in the past migrated off the base and then we put an extraction fence along the base boundary and that prevents it from continuing to migrate further. So that's the CS10 groundwater plume and the last one is a Schumit Valley. And this plume originated from the same source area, the fire training area as the PFAS contamination. Uh, historically, this has been a, a, a chlorinated solvent plume uh, with perchloroethene and trichloro ethene in it. And here's um, another plume progression over time. Starting in 1999, we, we had installed a groundwater pump and treat system with three extraction wells. And you could see a combination of the pump and treat system and, and, monitor, and natural attenuation. The plume's broken up into these small lobes, which are even smaller today. This is 2019. Um, but the one thing I want to point out here is that back in 99, when we installed the treatment system, PFAS was there. We just didn't know about it. So we have been removing some PFAS since then using the, the treatment system that was installed for the chlorinated solvent plume. Um, so here's where we're at today with at least the chlorinated solvents, PC and TCE. There's just a few wells that are red, meaning that they exceed the, the drinking water standard. And those are anticipated to clean up uh, within a few years. But again, you know, we have um, PFAS and, and dioxane as another emerging contaminant that we're, that we're addressing as part of a Schumann Valley. And then the last slide I have here is, is transitions into PFAS is um, we do have a rec beach monitoring program, recreational beach monitoring program, where we sample surface water bodies and those are listed on this, um, they're listed here on the slide and shown on the figure. And uh, we continue to monitor those surface water bodies for the plume contaminants of concern. And we do know that we have PFAS present in both Schumann and Johns Pond. And the reason the PFAS is there is because of the fire training area is just up gradient. So the uh, conceptual model shows the PFAS coming out of the fire training area from the activities that occurred in the past there and has migrated down gradient, upwelled into Schumann Pond which is again a kettle hole. Remember I talked about that being basically groundwater and then it migrates from a Schumann Pond into John's Pond. And John's Pond has two surface water outlets, the Quashnet River and the Childs River. So we, we know that there is PFAS in those rivers as well as further down gradient in the groundwater. And again, Matt, um, Mary's gonna be talking more about uh, that conceptual site model, so. At this point, I can either take questions or we can just turn it over to Mary to continue on with PFAS. Rosa, you're on mute. Okay, um, there was a question on the chat. Um, on one of the first map slides, uh, there was a question, um, what do you mean when you refer to a site as open versus closed? Sure, so uh, an open site means it's active and we're uh, still either monitoring it or we might be working on a closure document, but a closed site means that um, we've gone through the circle process and we completed the uh, appropriate investigation or removal and we prepared the appropriate uh, documentation to officially close out the site as far as the circle process goes. So the site's closed, we're not doing anything further with it, it's cleaned up and we're done. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure that people uh, have a clear understanding of what the health effects are from the uh, perchloroethate and trichloroethate and the dioxane, but uh, just 
briefly, there are a number of health related effects, particularly as they are carcinogenic uh, and have other systemic effects. So it's uh, wonderful so far to see all the progress that you are making. So um, are there any other, if there are no other questions, we would love to welcome Mary. Great. Uh, Mary, do you want me to advance the slides for you or do you want to take over the screen? Oh, no, if you could advance them, that'd be great. You already have it open, so. Okay. Okay. Just and let me know when you're ready. Sure. You guys can all hear me okay then? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Yes. Okay, so Is just it gonna possible at all for you to put it on slideshow so that the screen would be bigger for the slides? Otherwise, this is- Is that better? That's the slideshow feature I have. I think the other way, they were bigger, right? The other one might be better for you. Thank you. Okay. Sure. I'm gonna give you guys an update on the emerging contaminants investigations that we're completing in the Mashpee area. And so the one site Rose already mentioned, uh, AV, that's the Schumann Valley site. And we're completing what's called the supplemental RI, a supplemental remedial investigation. And that's for two emerging contaminants, PFAS and 1,4-dioxane. And uh, Rosa gave a good overview of PFAS. And just quickly, 1,4-dioxane, uh, the primary industrial use was to stabilize chlorinated solvents. And as Rose went over these, um, Wounds, a lot of them are chlorinated solvents. So we also are looking for 1,4-dioxane there. And 1,4-dioxane is also used in a lot of you know, household products, cleaners, detergents, cosmetics, paints, all that kind of stuff too. So, and PFAS, um, our, primary, our source of PFAS on the base is uh, aqueous film forming foam. It's called AFFF. And it's a uh, firefighting foam that the Air Force used um, in fire, in fire training exercises and to suppress any vehicle fires or aircraft fires and other fire suppression systems since 1970. Um, so, uh, and this one uh, for AV, it's called the supplemental RI because we did the original RI was for the chlorinated solvents. And um, we're also investigating flight line area sites. And what we're doing there is called an expanded site inspection. Um, that's at seven different sites, and these sites that are listed below, they um, have used AFFF, either um, they were used for storage and there was accidental releases, or it was used for training, or uh, also as an emergency response. And I'll go into more detail each of the sites uh, a little later. But I also just wanted to explain, um, you know, Rose said that we follow the uh, circular process, the super fun process, and uh, so the first phase of that is called the preliminary assessment. And in that one, uh, you basically do interviews and record search. And in this case, it was to see if AFFF was ever used at a site. And then um, the next phase, you'll look at those sites where it was used to see if it was ever released into the environment. And, um, and that's the site inspection phase. Um, so we have confirmed it was released into the environment at these sites and uh, the RI um, or supplemental RI for Shima Valley, that's where you actually define the nature and extent and evaluate site risks. And then after that, you do a feasibility study to look at different alternatives for treatment. And then once you decide uh, you know, what you're gonna do um, for remediation, you do the proposed plan and then um, you know, a record of decision that documents what, um, you're, what you're gonna do. And there is public involvement when you get to the um, proposed plan phase. Okay, I think I covered everything on this. Can you go to the next slide, please, Rose? Yeah, I just wanna say that there's opportunity for public involvement. I mean, that's the formal public involvement, but you know, we do presentations like this all the time. We have uh, joint base Cape Cod cleanup team meetings as well. So, you know, we welcome input at any time um, and we try to offer more opportunities for public involvement in addition to the circular prescribed timeframes. Okay, go ahead, Mary, thanks. Okay, sure, yeah. So, um, 
as you guys probably know, these PFAS standards have been um, changing over time since we started the program. So in May 2016, that's when the EPA issued the final health advisory values, and that was just for PFOS and PFOA. Uh, so for each of them or combined, if you have both of them at a site, and that's 0 0.07 micrograms per liter. And then uh, the state has issued various um, standards. Um, in June 2018, it was um, an Office of Research and Standards Guideline number that was also 0.07, but it was for five combined PFAS compounds. So instead of just adding PFOS and PFO, you also add PFNA, uh, this is hexane and a heptane or the other ones. And then um, in April of 2019, they added a sixth compound called PFDA and they lowered the standard to 0.02 micrograms per liter. And then in October of 2020, um, that same standard was issued as a Massachusetts maximum contaminant uh, level of 0.02. And then um, another PFAS compound, PFBS, um, in May of 2021, the EPA released updated toxicity information for that, which uh, lowered their RSLs from 40 micrograms per liter to 0.602 micrograms per liter for groundwater, and from 130,000 micrograms per kilogram to 1,900 micrograms per kilogram. And you can see that PFBS, the toxicity, is um, much lower than it is for say PFOS and PFOA, which have um, lower standards. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, response action. So as we would do the investigation, um, we would do outreach to see if there were any potential private wells in the area or you know public wells we knew of, of course, but. Um, and then we would uh, sample the wells uh, to see if they were impacted. And so we sampled 122 private wells to date. And there's currently three wells that have PFOS and PFOA concentrations uh, that are greater than the EPA LHA. Um, we sampled eight public water supply wells. Uh, two of the wells had PFOS and PFOA greater than the LHA. One uh, well that was shut down, the Mashpee Village well, uh, that uh, wellhead treatment was added by AFCAC, so that well is now operating again. And another well was removed from service, and uh, those customers were connected to municipal water, again by AFCAC. Uh, there's two other Mashpee public water supply wells, the Turner Road wells, have PFAS 6 concentrations greater than the MMCL, but they're below the LHA. And both of those wells are currently offline. Uh, we're still supplying bottled water to just one resident, and mass, mass, and that's resident has um, has been getting bottled water uh, from us for a while. And so what we do when we usually when we identify a property, um, you know, we sample it, and then if the concentration was above the LHA, we would um, supply bottled water until we could um, either hook them up to a municipal water, or we would give them a filter system. So we did install 13 filtration systems before them were removed, after those homes were connected to municipal water. And six of them were turned over to the homeowners because the concentrations had to decrease below the LHA. So, um, you know, they, we didn't need to continue to maintain them, but the homeowners still wanted to keep them. Uh, there's just three that are still operating, and then the three that I mentioned in the first bullet that are above the LHA and uh, those homes are you know, slated to be connected to municipal water. So, so far 108 connections are made to municipal water supply and that includes the one public water supply well that supply 93 units at a trailer park. Okay, next slide. Okay, so for the AV supplemental RI, we've been, um, that's still ongoing, but we're pretty much wrapping up the field program now. And we uh, sample groundwater, soil, surface water, sediment, private wells, public wells, and also uh, the treatment plant for the um, Schumacheli chlorinated solvent bloom. And uh, PFAS groundwater contamination extends downgrading of Schumann and John's Pond as Rose Ro showed in that figure. And uh, we've actually collected samples from over 240 locations to date. 
And um, the highest PFAS6 concentrations are still detected in, in the source area. So we still have high, the highest concentrations in the source area. And um, surface water samples were collected from 10 ponds and rivers. So another eight in addition to a Schumann and John's pond. And the highest concentrations for PFOS and PFOA, 0.2 micrograms per liter and 0.059 for PFOA. They were detected in samples collected from a Schumer pond. And then mass DPH, they evaluated these concentrations and they concluded there was no risk of harm for recreational use of the ponds. And uh, the one for dioxin groundwater contamination, that's very limited in extent. We only have three locations that exceed the risk-based concentration, which is 0 0.46 micrograms per liter. And the highest concentration is 0 0.75. So um, I do have a figure to, to show you um, both of those. Yeah, so this one shows the distribution of PFAS and these are what we call HITS maps. So the red symbols indicate that there's an exceedance of the PFAS-6. Um, green is not detect and yellow is um, uh, detection, but that's below the PFAS-6 concentration. And so you can see the source area, Rose had pointed that out, is a, the fire training area and also the former uh, sewage treatment plant on the base uh, where the two source areas were the Shumut Valley plume and but the fire training area is the primary source for this PFAS uh, contamination. So we are going to, when we're doing the RI report, we're going to call the site the fire training area because that is really more accurate. So you can see um, we have a kind of a dashed red line defining the, the current plume boundary. We're still doing some investigation uh, down gradient just to confirm the leading edge of the PFAS 6 plume. And um, there, is that, there is one uh, red dot there at DT43. And it's, you know, it is red, but um, that has a very different uh, PFAS signature. Like all of the uh, these fire train these uh, these sites that have used AFFF, PFOS is the predominant um, uh, PFAS that we see, and that site had a had a different signature, and it also was right at the water table. It's pretty far down gradient to have a uh, detection right at the water table, have it be associated with contamination from the ponds, and actually groundwater in that area at that shallow would flow from northeast to um, southwest. So um, the state is actually uh, sampling uh, some private wells that are in that area. And uh, we're doing some in additional investigation just to help uh, with defining uh, the source out there. And the other thing is, you know, as Rose shows, the, um, the AV plume is on there and, um, you know, you can see how it has reduced over time and um, you know, as Rose explained, the conceptual site model, the contamination uh, discharged into the pond and it's not volatile, PFAS is not volatile. And uh, so, yeah, it, the ponds recharge the groundwater and that's how this contamination spread out so far in uh, Mashpee and also Falmouth um, because the ponds basically became source areas for groundwater contamination. And um, I think that's it for this site. Oh, I just want to show um, Rose has, there's a figure up in the corner that um, shows the fire training area. There was also a, um, a, a thermal treatment unit uh, that to treat the, the VOC contamination in the soil. And um, it didn't reach temperatures high enough to treat PFAS. Of course, we didn't know PFAS was in the soil then. That was back in the mid to late 90s. And um, that treatment unit caught on fire and they used foam to put it out. So that's, again, yet another source in the fire training area of um, another source of the PFAS contamination. Oh, the next slide, please. Okay, this shows the 1,4-dioxane um, contamination at the site. And as you can see, there's just the three red dots. And if you look in the source area, they're all green. So 1,4-dioxane has detached from the source area, just like the chlorinated solvent plume. 
and um, you know it's very very limited in extent so it's not really a, a, a big player it probably will not um, become a COC for a mission with Valley Bloom but that did basically follow more the, um, the path of the chlorinated solvent contamination and uh, PFAS are uh, very different because they absorb to the soil. So um, you know, we still have the highest concentrations up in um, the source area for PFAS. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, this just shows the uh, source areas. And what we did over the fire training area was we made um, basically a grid uh, for the sampling program, and we collected groundwater samples and, and soil samples in all the interior grids there. And then the, the outer grids, we collected um, some soil samples to try to define the extent of soil contamination there. And uh, the other figure shows the, um, uh, the sewage treatment plant area and the former sewage treatment plant. and. Um, you know, those also show sample locations. We did soil sample locations. They're not hits, even though they are red. And, uh, and um, we didn't see a lot of contamination there. Um, you know, we thought wastewater, um, we would see um, some more PFAS contamination in the wastewater, but uh, most of the contamination is from that fire training area where they repeatedly applied um, AFFF as part of the, the training up there. Next slide, please. Okay, this is um, this shows you some private wells that um, happen to be located near the Curry Road infiltration trench. And once we realized that there, you know, at some point could have been some releases, because uh, as Rose said, we would monitor and change carbon out for the VOCs, but we didn't know PFAS was out there. Now, in the beginning, the carbon was changed out, you know, very frequently. And so we don't think there was any releases, but there was one time where it was something like 18 months between the carbon exchange as the plume got smaller and um, you know, we didn't need to do as many carbon exchanges. So we think there was a release of um, PFOA into the environment there. And uh, PFOS is treated more efficiently than in carbon than PFOA. So PFOA would break through the carbon first. And this area did have pre uh, some predominantly PFOA um, exceedances. And you could see them in red. And so we stopped using that trench. And, and then we could see as um, upgrading water migrated through the area, um, those, those wells all you know, became non-detect or below the, um, the standard. So, okay, next slide. Okay, this shows uh, the construction uh, of the uh, treatment building that was put into tree for PFAS at the Mashpee Village Water Supply Well, just to give you an idea of the scope of these projects. And those are carbon filters in there, uh, inside there, to, uh, that uh, are used to treat uh, the PFAS for that public water supply well. Okay, next slide. Okay, so on to the um, expanded SI for the flight line area. We um, completed the field work in December of 2020, and uh, we just finished uh, the finalizing the expanded SI report, and that went out uh, last month. And so we, um, the groundwater from six of the seven sites that we looked at migrate downgrading to the Schumann and Johns Pond area. So, and those uh, sites are gonna proceed to an RI and they're gonna, they're all located in pretty close proximity. So we're gonna investigate them collectively as a flight line operable unit. So the former fire department building, obviously that was a fire department building. So they stored um, a triple F and in vehicles and there were some accident releases and also some releases during training. The lower 40 ramp area uh, was storage and some accidental releases. They also um, cleaned out some hoses um, after they were used um, with AFFF. And 
the uh, helicopter hangar was also used. Um, they also stored and accidentally released AFFF. The former building 118, uh, that site, they did time and distance training over 10 years. And um, they also would flush out the hoses there. Uh, the Coast Guard hangars um, stored and had accidental releases, um, some of them during fire suppression system testing. And ANG motor pool, that site, um, some uh, fuel spilled from a refueler truck, and then AFFF was used as a response action. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this just shows you the locations of the sites. I'm just going to wrap up quickly here. So um, each of the sites are identified, and then there's particle tracks that show their discharge point. Um, so from the source area, uh, where groundwater would migrate to and uh, discharge. You can see most of them discharge to the downgrading ponds, or Shuma Pond and uh, Moody Pond. And again, these, in, in this slide, um, the hits are for PFOS and PFOA above the LHA. Um, and all the sites had a PFOS, PFO above the LHA. So, um, you know, they're going to an RI, but in the RI, we'll use the PFAS 6 uh, standard to define the extent of plume contamination. And these sites also uh, show you which location for each site had the highest PFOS and PFO concentration. And if you um, go to the next slide, Rose, this is the last slide. This just gives a summary of all the sites where we have a PFAS contamination and what the highest PFOS, PFO, or PFBS, and then the PFAS 6 concentrations are at each of those sites. And Ashima Valley uh, by far has the highest um, concentration of PFOS of 130 uh, micrograms per liter. And also just about units, we use micrograms per liter, which are parts per billion. I know sometimes you may see it in parts per trillion, which is nanograms per liter. But to be consistent with, um, you know, the chlorinated solvent plumes, we, we always talked about um, micrograms per liter, even the EDB plumes as well. So we um, just use um, micrograms per liter to be consistent on the program. Okay, so that's it. If um, you guys have questions for us. I have a couple of questions. Um, Andrew, did you want to talk first or have um, them answer some questions first? Entirely up to you guys. Okay, well, I have just a, a few very specific questions. Um, one is uh, what is uh, an SI uh, versus an RI? Sure, so a, a site inspection, that's what we're doing in the flight line area. So in a site inspection, you're confirming that there was a release um, to the environment. So it may have limited groundwater sampling or you know, also groundwater and soil, but you're not defining the full extent of contamination. You're just confirming that it needs to go on to the next phase, which is the RI. And in the RI, that's when you do a more expansive field program to define the full extent of contamination. Thank you. Yeah, and also in also in an RI, you do a risk assessment. So for human health and ecological, which you don't address as part of the SI. Okay, so there are different levels of investigation. Yeah, um, definitely. How is PFAS removed from soil? Um, there's a couple. There's different ways uh, you can excavate the soil. Right, and then you could treat it through incineration. Um, there's some technologies that are being evaluated now in terms of uh, like so washing the soil, like you know, to help extract the PFAS and then um, be able to remove it. And then the PFAS has to go somewhere else, uh, which normally ends up being incineration. Um, there's some other technologies like plasma technology that are being explored that aren't than aren't incineration type techniques. You can also use um, what, what's been done with landfills. You could put a cap over it and prevent water from uh, getting down into the soil and continuing to leach it out. So a cap could take the uh, form of a asphalt parking lot or it could do a traditional landfill type cap. Uh, so those are the common ways uh, that come to the top of my mind. Mary, do you have anything else? Any other? Oh. 
technologies? No, that, I think that's all good. It's just there is a lot of research going on right now. And, um, you know, people are testing all different kinds of methods for cleaning up PFAS in soil. So there may be some, you know, more treatment technologies down the road. Mm -hmm. Well, it does sound like you would have to um, test the depth of the PFAS contamination in terms of what has to be excavated and treated. Uh, so it does sound like an extensive process. Um, the last question for now is, um, can PFAS be removed from ponds? You mentioned the Ashamed and John's ponds were considered safe for recreational purposes, but the PFAS is still in there. and that may not be a comfort to people knowing that that's in there. Can it be removed? Hmm. Yeah, that's a big undertaking. I think the best thing to do would be to prevent the contamination from uh, continuing to upwell into the ponds. So uh, one technology we used for phosphorus was a permeable reactive barrier along the shoreline. We also used an alum treatment um, to help reduce and immobilize phosphorus. There's really nothing available like that for PFAS yet, but as Mary said, there's a lot of research going on uh, in terms of technologies that might be available to act um, similar to those that I mentioned. Um, but you know, to treat to treat that water, and <laughs> there's just so much water. I mentioned the aquifer is very prolific, and it just continues to fill the pond. So the best thing would be to target where the PFAS is coming into the pond and keep it. Um, you know, extract it before it continues to upwell. Yeah, yeah. If we can remove um, or stop the contaminated groundwater from discharging into the pond, the ponds will eventually flush out of um, PFAS. And you know, we are looking into what kind of time frame that would take once the source is cut off of gradient. That seems to be the problem with all of our waters: is stopping the source. Uh, thank you very much for your presentations, uh, both Rose and Mary, and welcome, Andrew. Hi, good evening. So I don't have an enormous amount to add. I, I will point out that, you know, our, our issue as it relates to the Turner Wells, and for those who aren't familiar, you know, the Mashpee Water District is a separate municipal entity from the town of Mashpee. It serves the same people same geographic boundaries, but it's not a town function. Um, and so the water district um, has been in this uncomfortable position of having its Turner Road wells offline as a result of the contamination. And they've been caught in this middle ground of being above the state standard for drinking water, um, which is a new standard and they preemptively Saw the standard coming, took the well offline to be protective of people's well-being as best they could, um, but it's below the federal limit. And, you know, for those that, that watched, we had a spirited conversation um, with representatives from the uh, military base several weeks ago at a selectman's meeting at the time, position of the Air Force, uh, which has subsequently changed, had, was that because it was below the federal limits, but above the state limits that uh, the feds were not compelled to um, remediate and that the remediation was gonna be at the expense of the water district. Uh, that position has subsequently in the last, I don't know, what, two weeks changed. Um, so for, in the short term, people in Mashpee, that's a good outcome um, under the circumstances so that the uh, costs and, and installation of that facility will not be at Mashby Water District taxpayer expense, will be covered by the Air Force. Um, and so that's a relief to us. But it points out, you know, a recurring thematic problem where, you know, we live in a state where there's a little bit more uh, aggressiveness with setting health standards for drinking water and cleanup standards in contaminated sites that oftentimes, as in this instance, get ahead of, in a good way, in my opinion, the uh, federal standards that apply. And um, 
the circumstance that we found ourselves in uh, with the PFAS compounds um, is a circumstance we've been in in the past, uh, I believe, with the, with the base uh, where there's been an exceedance of Massachusetts standards, but not one of the federal standards. And I guess what I'm really worried about um, is that it's going to happen again. Um, and the reason I say that is there's a list of unregulated contaminants uh, longer than your arm that for which there are not federal standards yet that have been released into the environment, potentially at the base, potentially in other locations um, from a wide variety of uses. And I think the probability that with lower detection limits uh, and future explorations that this situation may repeat itself with a compound with which none of us are currently familiar. Um, and so, and I say that because that's what's been happening. Um, you know, when all this exploration was done, you know, in the early, late uh, 1980s, 90s, and in the early 2000s, nobody was talking about PFAS compounds. Um, or if we were talking about them, levels of detection were not uh, able, sensitivity of the uh, lab methods were not able to pick them up at the rate that, and the levels we're seeing now and the rate and the levels at which they're being regulated. And it's been collectively our experience that um, detection limits get better. Uh, and as they do, we find more things in our water, not just associated with the base, but with just general overall human activity and public health standards are becoming more and more stringent. Um, and so it's every reason to believe that um, this scenario will recur with a different alphabet soup of compounds over which you know, we're gonna be concerned. And so um, while people should walk away from this feeling better that uh, the Air Force is stepping in and doing the right thing by the people of Mashpee, uh, we need to continue to pay attention to groundwater explorations, the designation of future compounds, uh, the health limits associated with them, and remain ever vigilant that um, when there is a release from whatever source, military, non-military, um, that the district is able to provide um, a quality of water that meets the health needs of its customers. So, um, this is, I think, a, a case that provides a real life education to the people that are here now, um, that some of us who've been around this plume and these plume sets for a while have learned and have been reminded of, sadly, uh, and be prepared for the next set because I think there's more coming. So on that happy note, I'll stop. Uh, thank you so much, Andrew. Um, I think that, um... Mary is, Adams just made a very good point that the more that we learn about water issues, the more we hear the term contaminants of emerging concern. And um, I guess we just need to stay vigilant and stay tuned. Yeah, the, um, thing, that, the other thing to think about on these roads is that, uh, Rosa, is that, you know, we regulate these compounds one at a time for their known or suspected health effects. We don't know a heck of a lot about um, the synergistic effects of these compounds in combination over time um, and the combined health effects. So it's not just the list of CECs, it's also understanding uh, and being aware of the additive impact of these different contaminants and how they work in concert with one another uh, to create potential health effects down the road. And that whole field of discussion is even less well advanced than the list of emerging contaminants. So there's a lot to remain vigilant for on. It's not to say, you know, it's not light your hair on fire that there's no place to get good water and it's all poisonous. I'm not saying that at all. It's regulated to the best of our knowledge, but our knowledge is awfully limited. And so, um, you know, it will continue to evolve and we'll continue to revisit these conversations to determine how safe is safe and where are the breakpoints in terms of what people are willing to tolerate and not tolerate. Oh, 
So, so much to think about. Um, in public health, we call that um, synergy, chemical synergy. Uh, it's not an additive effect, it's a multiplicative effect when you combine those chemicals together in terms of the health risks that they create. Uh, so, um, as the uh, technology improves for being able to detect um, these chemicals, I guess our filtration systems are going to get better. Um, Douglas Carson did add a note to the chat that there's a correction to his email address that's up on the screen. So if you're interested in uh, contacting Doug, please look at the chat now to correct that. And if that... <laughs> sorry about that, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. There's just no not a problem. There's no one in front of the at symbol, I think. Uh, no period. There's no dot one uh, in front of the at symbol. Um, but thank you all so much for participating this evening. And I hope that um, you will continue to be part of the conversation. Thank you. Thanks for having us.